Welcome and good morning or evening to our guests, students, faculty, alumni, colleagues, and friends. My name is Giovanni Santamaria. I'm the chair of the undergraduate programs at the School of Architecture and Design at the New York Institute of Technology. I am, I am, I am pleased to welcome all of you to this event on behalf of our Dean, Maria Perbellini. New York Institute of Technology School of Architecture and Design is participating through multiple venues to the 17th International Architectural Exhibition, Venice Biennial 2021. Some of the work from our student is in fact exhibited in the Italian pavilion titled Resilient Communities, curated by Alessandro Melis in the section Architecture as Caregiver, curated by our Dean Maria Perbellini. Today's event is also part of the virtual Italian pavilion City X Venice, curated by Tom Kovac and Alessandro Melis, with the uh, creative director Maria Perbellini. The theme of our lecture, event, uh, lecture and event series uh, this year, 2021, is correlated crisis. 20, 2021 marked a critical year in which environmental, health, economic, and social crises have become correlated, beginning, uh, bringing forward the emergence of unforeseen global issues to be addressed with urgency. The Summer and Fall 2021 Lecture and Event Series at the School of Architecture and Design New York Institute of Technology creates opportunities to discuss how architecture, design, and urbanism can dis uh, disclose implicit parameters and activate structural transformation in our ecological, social, and built environments. From how reality is measured and validated to automation and computational thinking, the series aims to question possibilities for disciplinary actions. This event is a joint collaboration of New York Institute of Technology, School of Architecture and Design, and the Digital Futures, Tongji University, Shanghai. The event today is organized and moderated, moderated by Professor Tom Barabes of the School of Architecture and Design at the New York Tech. And it raises important questions about the shifting paradigm on, uh, of globalization with the ongoing transformation created unexpectedly by the COVID-19 pandemic. In our school, this event is one of a number of public offerings of lecture and events, which is the, uh, in the past year and a half, have investigated the future consequences of the discipline of architecture, design, and urbanism as our world is reshaped. These are explored from an academic and a professional perspective. These events ask now many, um, these events what, uh, ask what now may stand in place of paradigms of progress, growth, and connectedness within a globalized view of culture, commerce, and architectural thought and practice. We are pleased to have uh, four esteemed panelists with us today, presenting their work and research and sharing their thoughts. They are based in UK, China, Australia, and US. Each of us practice, research, and teaching uh, focus on making sense of a world of diverse identities, contexts, and forces. I now leave the floor to Professor Tom Barabes, who will introduce the topic of this event in greater detail, along with the four presenters and panelists. I would like to welcome uh, all of you, welcome all of you again, and thank for joining us. Thank you very Tom. much, Giovanni. Thank you very much. Um, as Giovanni introduced me, my name is Tom Verabas. I'm a uh, professor of architecture here at the School of Architecture and Design at New York Tech. Uh, this event, uh, it, I, I will hope it that it raises questions uh, concerning the paradigms which drive uh, global urban organization and development uh, within a context of the ongoing transformations triggered by the COVID-19 or 21 pandemic. Um, and with potentially enduring impact on urbanism and architecture. Cities and urban citizens worldwide have faced challenges as a result of lockdown restrictions on mobility in international networks, as well as locally, and the temporary exodus of cities uh, in 2020 of, by some of the privileged classes. Uh, we, we hope this evening to unpack issues of global well-being of the Anthropocene, our planet's ecology, regional, national, and local identities, and the economic fallout of the intertwined crises faced in our disciplines and professional fields. 
For several decades, architectural practice, research, and education has championed an evolving model of globalization, which has been synchronized with the flows of transnational investment and mobility. Architecture has become as much an agent of global capitalism as it has been a device for its resistance. The years 2020 and 2021 have demonstrated how the paradigms of progress, growth, and connectedness are at once on pause and are now in some disarray, evidenced by, for example, by curtailed supply chains, limitations on global travel, uh, even fuel shortages in the UK. Mobility, in particular, is most immediately being reshaped. The pandemic has upset the stability of the way we understand, or did understand, and conceive and express urbanity in the design disciplines. Global models of architecture and urban design have been championed by theorists such as Manuel Castells, who coined terms encapsulating paradigms such as the network city or the information city, in which our immense world is made miniature, manageable, connected, and proximate by a range of physical and electronic network infrastructural systems, enabling the flow and exchange of information, knowledge, money, and people. Celebrating the unregulated global economic order, neoliberalism gave birth to the privileges of the so-called transnational elites and the inequitable burden of those that serve uh, the privileged, as sketched uh, by Saskia Sassen in her various texts, uh, in her taxonomy of the paradigm, the global city. Uh, in this history of, of the global in architecture in 1995, Rem Koolhaas, long after his uh, uh, Manhattanism, had theorized the generic city, springboarding from the nondescript yet ubiquitous features of the urbanism of Atlanta towards a globalist view of sameness. Published in the same year was his big bigness essay, which placed the generosity of architecture, as he called it, to be pitched against the meanness or stinginess of architecture, sketching the context of the contemporary globalist architect and urbanist and the international work of OMA for years to come. Meanwhile, meanwhile uh, Marc Auger in the same year cur curiously wrote Non Places, Introduction to an Anthropology of Supermodernity, in which the concept of supermodernity is posited to describe the spatial logic of these late capitalist phenomenon, a logic of excessive information we receive in soulless and personal spaces, such as airports, malls, highways, etc. The city as an object of study has at the extreme neologisms such as the megalopolis uh, from the 1960s, the megacity, and more recently urban metropolitan regions uh, across, uh, happening across all continents. Uh, many of these urban regions now in excess of 100 million in population. Uh, some of my nostalgic references to urban theorists, a global mobility of the millennium, only scratch the surface of 50 years of postmodernity and its angst. If we look back to the radical era of the 1960s and 70s, when modernism, as the last unified movement in architecture, was dismantled by sustained and diverse attacks, whereas Tafuri had tentatively clarified architecture's relationship with capitalism, Frederick Jameson later offered further resistance. Ken Frampton successfully reoriented a great part of a generation from embodying universal technique, as he called it, to an apparently more critical valorization of regionalism. Fragmentation followed into contextualism, historicism, the new urbanism movement, and many other isms on the right, flanked by the emergence of grassroots participatory practices and a new generation's will for more equitable, just, and sustainable cities. In place of modernist universality, Sanford Quinter and many, many others have posited the city to be located everywhere and that cities are an expression of the inherent complexity of our civilization, our societies, and our planet. Urbanism now has prefixes attached to it, such as emergent, adaptive, informal, aformal, parametric, computational, eco, green, sponge, responsive, sentient, and smart, just to name a few. Given the expansion of our augmented cybernetic capacities today, we interact increasingly more closely with complex dynamic forces, with the aim of harnessing, uh, harnessing them. Computation has enabled uh, data analytics, artificial intelligence, digital twins, XR, along with other technological arenas and apparatuses. Some of these approaches have been explored in our earlier panels this summer in the virtual Italian pavilion at Venice Biennale, in particular two panels on artificial intelligence and urbanism uh, 
uh, co-organized with my colleague Pablo Lorenzo Eroa. Technology is at once informing the trajectories of universalization and fragmentation, asking those at the leading edge to not only tool up for the transitions taking place, but to work towards shaping new paradigms to explain and guide us in a more quickly changing world than it was before 2020. Architecture and surely cities adapt and evolve to the challenges of crises and always have. Since March 2020, a more electronic form of globalization has accelerated and leapfrogged through the rapid uh, advancement of information and communication technologies to compensate for the injuries sustained to our pre-pandemic model of globalization. This event includes participants based in China, Australia, Europe, and the US, with the goal of interrogating how local and regional forces shape conceptions of culture and design practice in a series of distributed contexts. This global event is held online on Zoom, Facebook Live, YouTube, due to the ongoing reconfiguration of our model of globalization. Fortunately, we have this vehicle. Uh, I'll now introduce our panelists in brief uh, and in sequence of the four presentations, and then I'll introduce each panelist in greater detail before each presentation. Uh, first, we'll have Donald Bates, who's a chair of architectural design and associate dean for engagement at Melbourne School of Design in the Faculty of Building and Planning at University of Melbourne. Um, and Don's presentation is titled Paranormal Urbanism. Uh, second uh, presenting is Michael Weinstock, who's the director of the Emergent Technologies and Design Program at the AA in London. Mike's talk is, is titled Evolutionary Computation for Urban Morphogenesis in Extreme Biomes. Uh, third presenting is Dana Cuff, Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA in Los Angeles. And Dana will present uh, her presentation titled Designing Spatially Just Cities. Uh, last to present is Neville Mars, director of the Dynamic City Foundation in Shanghai. Uh, Neville, uh, who, he, it's very early in the morning and he will be joining us uh, uh, shortly. Um, uh, Neville's presentation is titled The Java Predicament, Progress or Preservation. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Don Bates in more detail right now. Um, as I said, he was the chair of architectural design and associate dean for engagement at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at University of Melbourne. He's the founder and director of Lab Architecture Studio. Um, uh, Don, uh, Donald Bates graduated uh, with a BARC from University of Houston and an MARC from Cranbrook Academy of Art. He's taught at the Architecture Association, Cooper Union, and founded and directed an independent architecture school, uh, Lopsia in France from 1990 to 94. In 94, uh, 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 Don Bates and Peter Davison founded Lab Architecture Studio, and in 1997, Lab won the competition for Federation Square in Melbourne. Lab has designed award-winning large-scale commercial, cultural, civic, and residential projects with built works in Australia, Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Um, Bates has lectured in more than 250 schools of architecture and has been published extensively in journals and magazines. He's been a jury member and chair of more than 28 international uh, architectural design competitions. Join us, please, to welcome Don Bates. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Thank you very much for both that introduction and for the invitation to be part of this event. It's a real pleasure to join the other panelists, but it's also, I have to say, a, a pleasure to join with NYIT, uh, given that I bo know both you and Pablo and a few other uh, new members of the faculty. So it's a real pleasure to be able to join in. I'm going to uh, share the screen, if that's OK, and start off here. Let's see. Okay. Right. I hope that works okay for everybody. I want to talk about uh, this little uh, notion of a paranormal urbanism because it, it seems to me that one of the issues that uh, we are have been operating under for at least the last 20 months is the notion, first of all, that there is a normal and that at some point we will soon return to it. Um, and I guess for me, that the, the putting together this, this prefix of para, which really implies being alongside of, being beside, being near, uh, resembling, or even being beyond or being apart from, 
or even abnormal. So this question of whether we, re we will return to a normal urbanism, whatever that might be, or whether we'll always be beside that sort of lost moment of when we seem to understand or seem to know what that normal might be. I'll talk about this from my position here in Melbourne in Australia, uh, and a position where I've been for effectively the last 24 years, although spending quite a bit of time in China and the Middle East as well. But Melbourne has effectively been my home for the last 24 years. During that time, Melbourne has um, prided itself on being voted the uh, world's uh, most livable city by the Economics uh, Intelligence Unit for eight years in a row. Uh, and this is an image from uh, 2017, a note again from one of the pages of the government uh, promoting Melbourne as a destination and why it's such a great city to live, work and study in. That sort of designation of Melbourne as the world's most livable city has been something that the, the city uh, and in fact Australia in general have taken great pride in. Um, not only has Melbourne, but Sydney and Adelaide have been up in the ranking. It's also important to note that the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit has a very specific set of categories on what they mean by world's most livable city. It certainly doesn't mean the most sustainable city. It doesn't necessarily mean the most uh, uh, socially uh, equitable city because it's really based on what does it mean for certain businesses to move their employees from one major capital to another. So the matrix and the index on which is this based is not always uh, something that one would totally aspire to, but it does give a certain nomenclature to a place like Melbourne. Um, Melbourne is currently a city of uh, about 5 million people. Uh, it's similar to a lot of Western cities in terms of a uh, uh, dense uh, CBD uh, core area, and then very low rise, very expansive uh, uh, suburban development that goes on uh, something like 50 kilometers in either direction. But again, the idea that uh, Melbourne would rely on and, and really focus on this uh, designation as the most livable city also says something about the characteristics that are here in terms including things like reasonably good public transportation, which is used a lot, both in terms of trams, um, suburban train lines, bus systems as well as an increasing network of bicycle uh, laneways and uh, routes. It's also a city where very different from my experience of places like Houston, which also have a very well-defined uh, CBD civic core and then suburban sprawl in all directions out of that, Melbourne has retained a, a, a vibrancy and activity in the CBD. So it's both a place where people live in the CBD it's where work takes place, but it's also where a lot of entertainment, food and beverage events, cultural activities, cultural destinations exist, which is something that I think is very different from the, the North American uh, incidents. These are just some images of, of Melbourne uh, around 2019. Some sense of the kind of laneways and the, the, the sort of subterranean scene that exists in Melbourne the activation at the major public uh, uh, train station, uh, which is very much in the center or right at the edge of the CBD along the riverside, and a very vibrant uh, retail uh, matrix, both of large scale uh, brands and uh, uh, retailers, but also very small scale uh, uh, artisanal developments and so forth. So that's what we thought of as our normal. That's what we imagined, that's what we experienced as the normal. That condition that seemed to be about increased densification, that seemed to be about multiplicity and variety, diversity, multiculturalism, which is a major feature of Melbourne and Australia in general. And this sense that we are here and experiencing through 
the activation, the constant activation of what it means to really live in an urban context. Now, 20 months later, we have another record that we can go by, which is that Melbourne has now been in lockdown longer than any other city in the world. And we're still in lockdown as of today and will probably remain so for another two to three weeks. So we already passed Buenos Aires uh, in terms of uh, this condition and continue onward in our lockdown situation. So it's a new condition, a kind of paranormal beside the normal, this condition that has really changed the way the city operates, changed it both as a destination as well. So these are those same streets that we saw before on a daily basis. We're in curfew, not only in lockdown, but curfew from 9 p.m. until 6 a.m. So those same streets that had that vibrancy, that sense of activation, that sense of destination, that sense of variety and diversity have become somewhat monolithic or monochromatic. That is to say they're empty and void. The stations are no longer the activity. And this is an interesting aspect of how that change then makes the thing that we strive for so much in terms of things like public transport now seen as a threat. The idea of getting crammed into a train, bus, or a tram with lots of other people is now a threat as opposed to a celebration of human connectedness. So here's where we stack up in some of this. As you can see already, Melbourne, and this was done a few days ago, so we're already over 250 days of lockdown um, compared to Buenos Aires, which had 245, and we can go down. But the other is to see the number of cases. The, the total of days of lockdown are also compared to the total number of uh, cases of COVID infection within Melbourne. 44,251 compared to, in some instances, 1.6 million, 2.28 million, um, 6.73 million, and so forth. So Melbourne is in a very peculiar situation of being the most locked down, closed out city in the world, and yet also one with some of the least amounts of infection and infection rates that are going on. So the streets of Melbourne are empty. There's very little shopping available, only strategic shopping in terms of food uh, and necessities or going to get a vaccination or going to the hospital and such. So this question of the near normal, the almost normal, and when do we come back and that aspiration for a return to normal to some degree. So this is the normal of Melbourne. Again, right in the center is the CBD, the Central Business District. And as you can see, expanding out in all directions are, is the suburban sprawl. So the normal that we also deal with is a normal of immense amount of commuter transportation, people traveling back and forth. Melbourne is still very much a center with spokes of roads and uh, activities and habitation extending to the horizons, but with people coming back into the city every day and going back home every evening. So the normal of huge commutes, of long distance traveling, of being away from home, being away from family in order to do work is a part of the normal as well, which might be considered an abnormal. So that the normal itself is abnormal. If we talk about a 20 minute city or a neighborhood city and the degree to which that Melbourne in its normal condition as the world's most livable city was also predicated on a very abnormal form of lifestyle. Of the impacts that have happened through the pandemic, one of the first and foremost to talk about is the impact on international students. Melbourne, uh, gets its, its largest export industry is in fact education. Something like $13.5 billion every year coming from international students who come to Melbourne to study. 
It creates almost 80,000 jobs in terms of international education. So effectively, it's the number one employment industry uh, in Melbourne and so. Now with COVID and since the last week in February of 2020, no international students can come to Australia and come to Melbourne. This has had a huge impact on the universities, on the educational institution, but also on the culture of the city because the culture of the city with international students, again, created that diversity, that activation, that animation that really filled the CBD and the uh, immediate uh, neighborhoods and, and precincts with uh, a lifestyle. Again, the question I raised before, public transport, where now public transport is seen as a threat, where Melbourne was moving to a condition of greater and greater patronage of public transport and less and less reliance on uh, individual car ownership. But that's now reversed itself in the sense that it, people see public transport as a, a, a potential threat through transmission of the virus. So what does it take then to go beyond normal? And this question of commuting, on the one hand, now, because so many people are working from home, there's a, a significant decrease in the amount of commuting that takes place around Melbourne. So this means that people are not spending all of their day traveling back and forth to work because work is home and home is work. It also means that there has been reductions as we've seen around the world in terms of some of the pollution created by transport and travel. And so again, what is the normal that we want to return to? Density, which was really one of the mainstays of Melbourne's development, increasing density, increasing density in terms of the CBD, but also in terms of the inner suburbs, going from single story uh, residential housing to multi-story residential housing, allowing for Melbourne to be the fastest growing city in Australia. And before the pandemic, Melbourne was uh, projected to grow by 2056 to 11 million people. That is to say another 5 million people on top of what was already here. In fact, now, that has reduced so that by the end or by 2022, Melbourne will have actually lost 400,000 residents, uh, as well as the lack of those new residents that had been projected to, to come. And we see this change also from center to periphery. Whereas before there were clearly suburban developments and suburban centers and shopping and so forth, but the center, the CBD of Melbourne, the downtown of Melbourne has been an incredibly active place for the last 25 years. And now it's the quietest place in the whole of the metropolitan region. What it means though, is that again, that challenge between seeing the center as a place that one has to go to to work and come back home from, or whether now we start to develop the peripheral um, centers that start to produce a change in the perception and change in the operation of the city from no longer being a single center and moving in, but also multiple centers of the city. So a paranormal, something beyond the normal. And the shift from nine to five, five days a week till now maybe four hours a day, maybe 12 hours a day, maybe three days a week, maybe two days a week. These are incredibly interesting shifts in the way that we work and the way that we manage across the day-to-day -day life. And then finally, to end on this question of face-to-face -face versus online, Tom gave a great introduction about the changes that have taken place. And historically, one of the issues that Melbourne and Australia in general has had is something called the tyranny of distance, that is just too far for people to go there. Although it is a destination and a world's most livable city, it's also too far for people to travel. When I invite people to come and give lectures at the University of Melbourne, 
It takes a bit of negotiation to negotiate for someone to travel anywhere from 14 to 18 to 24 hours just to come to give a lecture. Once they're in Melbourne, I think they very much enjoy it and gain a lot from it. At the same time, by being online, we've had more lectures, more roundtables, more discussions, more engagements, just like the forum today than ever before. So the new normal, the new paranormal may be something where online activation is the center of how we deal with this tyranny of distance. So I'll end it there. These were just some thoughts on what it might be for us to exist in a time of a paranormal urbanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Don, uh, for your insights, especially for the context where you are in Melbourne, which is still under lockdown. Uh, we're fortunate uh, here in New York to be partially back on campus and most things uh, not so much uh, beyond normal or back to normal. Um, but I, I think you frame the problem really, really kind of articulately that the reliance upon mobility, whether it's the, the commuter belt of Melbourne or, uh, as you say, the tyranny of distance, um, uh, the, the economy and the culture or the sense that Australia is connected relies very much on, on quite long distance um, uh, uh, travel. And that's something which is still far from normal. Um, our second presenter, um, Dr. Michael Weinstock, uh, is the founding director of the Emergent Technologies and Design Program at, uh, and chair of the academic committee at A School of Architecture. Um, Mike Weinstock studied architecture at the AA and has taught there since 1989. We were colleagues for many years. Whilst his principal teaching and research has been conducted at the AA, he's published and taught widely in seminar courses, studios, and workshops on design science, urban morphology, ecology and metabolism, complexity and emergence, and associated topics, including fabrication and cons construction at many other schools of architecture in Europe, including Delft, Rome, Barcelona, Vienna, and in Stuttgart, and in the US at Berkeley, Rice, and Yale, and in Canada at Calgary, and in Japan at Tokyo University. His published work has arisen from research into the dynamics forms and energy transactions of natural systems, climatic and ecological changes underway, and the application of the mathematics and processes of emergence to cities, to human architectures at all scales. Um, Mike will present evolutionary computation for urban morphogenesis in extreme biomes. Thank you very much for joining us, Mike. Thank you for that um, uh, nice introduction, and thank you, Don, too, to very, very provocative. Um, okay, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Is that good now? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk. Uh, quite so much about uh, the ch change that we're in, I and mean, particularly in relation to COVID, uh, which I'm and my little research group are currently seeing as one of the effects of complexity and, and connection in the world. And we don't think this will be uh, the last uh, or most profound effect. Uh, and our, our research work starts with that um, uh, the premise that nature and civilization, um, that intelligence arises in both and spatial organization and material architects from collective extension of metabolism. And that's both the metabolism of living, th living things uh, and urban metabolisms. And we can look at ancient cities where we can see that how uh, culture and particularly the um, in this case the uh, uh, degrees of privacy are, are in, uh, embodied in the structure of a city in the way spaces connect to each other and the relative and this shift of different scales of spaces in, in a connective network so we can say that cities 
evolved within climatic and ecological systems that, that they are, and their culture evolved with them and it, it's most cultures that we see that when we look at the differences of them uh, within different biomes uh, evolved in different biomes cities were once situated the universal city in the city of the uh, 20th century particularly is the same uh, attempts to make the same city everywhere um, radically different and our work is founded on the axioms of, of complexity science and when we look at collapse and reorganization of any of any system uh, but particularly of uh, urban systems um that we're we're dealing with when cities when systems approach um the threshold uh, of collapse then really there are only three possible outcomes and they become more complex of, uh, by reordering and but of all the systems and and of the people within them uh, they fall away into simpler organizations for example when uh Roman Empire collapsed a quite different outcome in, in, in Europe, the smaller and simpler assemblies. Uh, and the people disperse, um, and the components of whatever system that is um, become absorbed into other systems. And there are alarming precedents. This was once one of the most uh, best connected cities on earth in its time it was on what was then the silk road a kind of super highway or a network um uh from that ran from china uh down through uh venice and the areas around there and connections to the west small climate change not as much as we're facing small climate change but an overwhelming expansion uh of, of people they cut down all the trees agricultural failure ecological failure and finally the dispersal of all the people so we think of cities as part of a topological network not as independent artifacts and of course we many of the practices that led to collapse in previous systems uh, we have our own version of them. This is from the, the dirty 30s uh, in the US, very poor um, agricultural practices, uh, but also very minor uh, and fairly regional uh, climate change of prolonged drought. This sentence, not the image, this uh, sentence comes from uh, Santelia, that each generation will have to build its own city. And it's as much a project of the imagination and of dreaming as it is a, a technical project the city that we have today is pretty much the new city that uh, many of the architects and one or two mentioned earlier uh, uh, from the early part of the 20th century in uh, their utopian dreams projecting forwards variously between 20 and 50 years so cities layered and separated through trunks or infrastructures multiple levels associated with different speeds, mass production of high density blocks. And the city, perhaps the most um, significant factor of that that we, we're dealing with and that uh, uh, Dom is referring to in a way, is, is the cities don't have uh, defined boundaries, that they continue, the idea was that they could continually expand. The idea of the agrarian city, of a city that somehow uh, included within itself its own means of agricultural production. This is from Hilbersheimer, I think, in around 1942 to 45, somewhere around there. Um, but we have cities without boundaries, and if we look at some of the some of the uh, big drawn projects of the 60s and 70s and 80s, everything seems to come from somewhere else. And nothing is grown within the city and no one really belongs there. Uh, Tom referred to Marc Auger, uh, re residence is transient, and the right to occupy a space is conditional on a purchase. And the periphery was for those that serve, and the centre is some, either somewhere you, you visited, but in a sense was um, elitist. And to that historical um, 
ways of producing collapse. We've added whole new ones. This is uh, from the Vietnam War, Napalm, three generational effects uh, still being felt. This is from Beijing, um, I think about eight years ago when I was there. And of course, we've added uh, larger catastrophes. Much of what we uh, produce and consume, uh, it, it's byproducts in production, but both in, in, in its um, end state, uh, producing uh, toxic pollutants. And in more recent times from Syria, uh, we can see um, how cities are physically de devastated. Some of the toxins produced by attempts to take apart and deal with the products, uh, the artifacts of civilization. Uh, some of the toxins have a half-life of up to 100, uh, 100 years and one or two up to 500 years. And we can see uh, the divisions. Um, this is, those of you who live in the US, probably not so shocking for you, but when the one of you, few times I've flown into um, LA, it seemed to, they, the plane seemed to take about 40 minutes and passing over this kind of endless brown carpet. Uh, this is Delhi, undifferentiated to a large extent and few discernible um, structures or spatial features within it. Most uh, quite famous image now uh, from Mexico City. And when we look at those, and often in, in architecture schools, and when we, we, we start to think about open futures, we forget that a significant fraction lives like this uh, in unmarked, undocumented, and often, often um, unnoticed uh, conditions on the periphery. And if we look again at Santelia's sentence, Many of the things we face now are comparable uh, to what his generation did, although they were facing a great war, but we have significant difference in the way uh, we can approach them. We have not in architecture, but we can borrow from other disciplines a much deeper understanding of natural processes. And we can produce on the laptop things that even 10 years ago would have been considered impossible in computation, have been uh, the realm of supercomputers. And we have dreams and calculations, which I'll return to at the very end. Um, and what we're, our work is focused on trying to find a synergy of ecology, climate, and spatial and social cultures. And why that is necessary uh, is, is the population increase. These are uh, figures from the World Bank. Um, if that's true, if that does come into effect, uh, we're looking for two. Uh, cities or urban systems that would accommodate a further 2 billion people. Evolutionary computation has quite a short history in terms of what you can do on a laptop. These are some very early uh, experiments from, I think, about 15 years ago, um, where the number of genes uh, and the amount that you could run on that uh, were relatively small. But nonetheless, we could look at simultaneously running four different uh, parameters and, and pitch them against each other and use that to produce uh, existing forms and starting with an original primitive, in this case, the Brunswick Center. And we're able to hold uh, the data for every single variation on that. Um, and, and these are, um, we can call out from the populations and look at any individual so they, this produced a very significant change in the design approach, so rather from a single patch or a single building, starting to think of design as something that's done in families and with large populations, each one of which <coughs> has a slightly different potential for adaptation uh, to <coughs> an existing climate or, or that we could posit. <coughs> Again, this is quite an older form of uh, evolutionary computation where one could look at, at uh, in, in this case, the sky view factors for openness in urban textures. Um, there's no single correct solution that it's looking for, um, but it's able to explore uh, 
uh, different configurations and their different uh, outcomes. A lot of urban computation uh, be has to begin with something. And it's, in this case, a significant uh, one that we uh, looked at was uh, the Barcelona, the SEDAR plan. And you can see uh, on, the, on the bottom left, uh, the procedure that we go through is looking at the different probabilities of mutation, uh, the rate of mutation and crossover is the, the uh, breeding between them. Different but related approach is taking a selection from an evolved pop population and looking to see what, how uh, those could uh, relate to each other in producing uh, urban networks. So the network's not predetermined or the major points of it are, um, but the internal structures that evolve a connectivity. Uh, and it's really just sorting through uh, an, a number of potential options. So pretty much this is how um, the process goes for a more sophisticated approach. So again, what we are seeing here is um, four different criteria that uh, um, would normally be considered one, one in more traditional approach, the way I always taught architecture, when we look for something that satisfies in some average way all four, but in this case, um, you're able to explore very different configurations that would optimize for um, and have different weighting between the four factors. Co-evolution, um, initially this was very difficult, but contemporary laptops can handle this very well, where the mode of analysis is simultaneous with the generative process. So in that case, network, and in this case, it's producing uh, for an extreme biome uh, in the Middle East and using the uh, idea of saltwater canals uh, for um, the, the cooling of the city. And the, those canals uh, evolve alongside uh, the urban blocks. We're beginning to see in some parts of the world, uh, this is Chicago, uh, where there is a data structure for energy use at any hour of the day. Uh, and in some cases, uh, in fractions of that, uh, for um, large areas of the city. In this case, I think in Chicago, uh, was only for the central part of the city. But nonetheless, these models, are these data models are becoming more and more available to us and um, uh, something we can work with. Istanbul will be one of the uh, cities that will go through uh, very profound climatic changes and also has uh, currently has um, uh, quite um, strong impacts from uh, uh, climate change already uh, impacting on it. And we're able to set up still with some um, difficulty, but still we're able to set up these kinds of analysis uh, where we can look at different levels of the radiant heat uh, simultaneously with alterations to, um, um, to, to the urban configuration. So this is one of the outcomes from uh, one of the PhD in design students um, looking at different models uh, and optimizing for um, airflow and temperature variance that's simply produced by uh, the morphology. There are also cultural uh, uh, fitness objectives, which is to do with uh, increasing the number of high level connections of taking what are very westernized forms, uh, but modifying them in the way of um, other parts of Istanbul that are more suitable to, to the longstanding culture of a number of uh, very high number of uh, interconnections uh, between the buildings. So simultaneously a kind of cultural objective and a climatic one. And we've been looking closely at how we can incorporate advances in other disciplines, in this case, uh, system dynamic models, and how to couple those to evolutionary models. 
um, system dynamics are widely used by ecologists to, to model predator prey, to, to model ecological relationships, uh, agricultural outcomes and so forth. And those softwares uh, are uh, as available as any architectural software. Um, and unlike many architects, they're, they're very happy to explain them how to, what they are and how to use them. So in this case, the model that was set up was both an evolutionary one and a system dynamics one. They looked at changes uh, to land areas uh, with a number of uh, people occupying it, agriculture, uh, water and energy consumption. And the outcomes that we produce of this, um, this was, um, um, took the idea of what, what was the relevant scale to work on this. And the smallest scale of a climate model is a kilometer square. So whilst this is urban patches, we traditionally study um, normally by infrastructural division um, or, or um, what are defined neighborhoods. In this case, we're trying to approach it through a climatic model and it's coupled to that. And what it's producing is an intricate landscape which is occupied uh, by people, has agricultural production, solar energy production, and uh, some rainwater harvesting, but mainly uh, water conservation. And this is set in uh, the edge of the Mediterranean uh, in, a, in very high temperatures. One outcome from this can be read like this. So for system dynamic models, this is what you get. Uh, and you have to find ways, uh, architectural ways to interpret that and deal with that. And that starts to show us how we can interconnect at different levels, looking for same sets of numbers or gradients. And gradients become a very strong feature of this. And each, each of those uh, areas, uh, the, there are four, four primary sets of data for but they accumulate to the um, what we might call a kind of agrarian superblock, which is a kilometer by a kilometer. The buildings aren't designed so much as envelopes with density models. And so uh, the outputs look something like this. And the beginnings of interpretation of how um, those particular volumes can be occupied uh, starts here. This, uh, I think this is going to open tomorrow or the next day. Um, there's a very interesting uh, science-based open data platform uh, that a lot of work's been going on in, in the mapping of ecological projects around the world at different scales. Um, and that one can join this network uh, and begin to see uh, in different parts of the world and different regions at different scales, uh, where are uh, projects that vary from uh, reforestation, uh, small scale farming um, that is more ecologically based rather than factory production based uh, and small, not yet much in the way of uh, urban ecologies, but we are hoping to uh, be able to contribute to that and to encourage a lot of other people interested in urban futures uh, to join that. There are lots of voices of doom. Um, this is probably the most famous one, uh, Wallace Wells. Um, yeah, and uh, the interesting book, The Uninhabitable Earth. Um, and looking at the Mediterranean in this case, about Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona has the potential, uh, as most of the Northern Mediterranean does, to the sands um, of profound drought. Uh, it has had a water shortage uh, in Spain, profound one uh, for more than 10 years and, and it is accelerating. And uh, as, a, as the, that is accelerating, the uh, ecology, plant life and so forth are dying. And dust migrates currently and they actually have uh, now an official organization to track the dust and produce models of um, the sand dust migrating from North Africa uh, into Southern Europe. This is perhaps a little, um, <laughs> little extreme image, 
uh, and that's uh, looking at the courtyard of a Dali, um, famous Dali building. So if you remember that the cities were once situated and we replaced them by the universal city, uh, the idea that city forms and city structures and infrastructures are the same everywhere. Um, and um, what can we replace them with? So the first thing is that the thinking of a city within the network, but also that it has in some way the ability to sense a critical change in this external environment and within itself. And it can change some aspect of that. When an adaptive city, adaptation uh, is kind of currently quite contested word, um, that it can select the attention. So very often uh, in, in complexity science, there, are, there is a conflict between what's good locally and the global system parameters. And finally, uh, the ambition is a city that is self-aware and it's not only able to select immediate responses and understand what the multiple sequences, uh, what, what the consequence of those be, but it's able to predict long-term and it's symbiotic, able to understand and be symbiotic with the local and global ecology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That's that's really fantastic. You you. Uh, I'm trying to stop sharing. Have I? Uh, not yet. I can I can do that for my own. Everybody. Can you? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for situating uh, a truly awfully daunting uh, urban, social, and ecological context, which we all know exists and we live in. Um, I'm equally as much as that's uh, awfully daunting and and totally depressing. Uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that your, your research has committed to um, augmenting our capacity to interact with these complex forces and problems, uh, and potentially that there are ways of, of mitigating this. Uh, this uh, yeah, I, I'm a true believer. I think we, we, we can design for, for these, what, what we now think of as quite terrible conditions, but that we can design for them so we can live in them. I'm sure we'll pick up this 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 line of conversation in our in our uh, discussion after the presentations, but uh, perhaps we'll move on to introduce uh, Dana Kuff, uh, who is the director of City Lab at UCLA and professor of architecture and urban design at UCLA. Um, uh, so City Lab is an award winning think tank that advances uh, experimental urbanism and architecture. Since receiving her PhD in architecture from Berkeley, Cuff has published and lectured widely about spatial justice, the architectural profession, and affordable housing. She's the author of several books, including The Provisional City about post-war housing in Los Angeles, and uh, co-authored book called Urban Humanities, New Practices for Reimagining the City, documenting her collaborative cross-disciplinary research and teaching at UCLA, funded by the Mellon Foundation. Based on City Lab's design research, uh, she has co-authored a landmark bill that permits backyard homes on virtually all 8 million single-family properties in California, doubling the density of suburbs across the state. She and her team are currently working on a wide range of new forms of affordable housing to be located with schools. In 2019, City Lab established an off-campus center in one underserved neighborhood in Los Angeles where deep multi-year exchanges with community organizations working to create more compassionate cities. Uh, Cuff is, re the, is a recent recipient of three prestigious awards, Women in Architecture Activist of, of the Year in 2019, awarded by Architectural Record, Researcher of the Year, um, awarded by ARCC in 2020, and Educator of the Year, um, awarded by AA Los Angeles in 2020. Uh, Dana will present Designing Spatially Just Cities. Please welcome uh, Dana Cuff, thank you. Thanks, Tom. I'll try to share my screen now. Okay. And you should be seeing that. Uh, are we good? Yes, perfect. Great. Um, 
I want to go back to something you said at the beginning, Tom. Uh, and of course, we're shifting gears entirely from Dawn to Mike and Mike to me. So I think the organizers are trying to get the full spectrum of something about global futures. But I was really struck by your characterization of globalization and our kind of uh, received wisdom of that being an economic phenomenon and that it was really the flows of big money and really architecture and urban designs connections to those via economies that shaped our understanding of what globalization meant. I think um, what I'm gonna talk about today is the fundamental shift in that notion of the global and globalization in cities, which the pandemic has made absolutely apparent. And is that, and that has to do with the kind of global interconnectedness of intimacies. And that we really need to be thinking architecturally about an entirely different restructuring of our discipline and profession around um, regimes, not of economy, but of care, of justice, of equity, and of inclusion. These things are, of course, tied to what Mike was just talking about with environmentalism. Uh, issues of ethics in the environment are very much tied to ethical issues in our social justice agenda. I'm gonna focus um, now, this evening, I guess, for most of the people who are attending on questions of what I will call spatial justice, uh, which is really rooted uh, in social justice concerns. This is a book I'm working on now, uh, and I'm just gonna describe a small part of it. Um, I think when we think about spatial justice in the city, we often think about um, the demolition or destruction of past injustices, at least in the United States. Um, it feels very strange to be representing the nation in this group, but uh, everyone's, I, I was appreciative, Mike, that you showed some of our classic Los Angeles imagery. Um, in the United States, the removal of these monuments to enslavement uh, are, a weekly event, this being the largest monument to the Confederacy and enslavement that was just taken down a few weeks ago in Richmond, Virginia. And you can see there was a long protest and resistance to the presence of this monument in what was once the capital of the Confederacy. So we're accustomed to seeing the taking away or the demolition of spatial injustice, but what does it mean for us in architecture and urban design to think about the building of justice into our cities? And I'm just gonna start by showing what I think in the United States is one of the uh, strongest examples of a spatially just um, building. This is of course the um, National Memorial for Peace and Justice, commonly known as the Memorial to Lynching built in Montgomery by Mass Design Group and the Equal Justice Initiative. And though we look at the building and can talk about it architecturally, one of the things that I think is most powerful about this is the levels of engagement that this building uh, encompasses. The one that I'm uh, showing here on the left are the monuments uh, that are duplicates, one hanging in the memorial itself and the other, an assembly of those same monuments out in the garden. These are uh, county by county counts of the numbers of people and their names who were lynched in those counties. Uh, and each county is to take its duplicate monument back as a kind of acknowledgement and recognition of past wrongs. Uh, at the last check, there were only two of these monuments that have been taken back by their counties. And, and that in and of itself is a sign of the a national resistance to recognizing its own past. Lest we think that this is an American phenomenon where of course we have 400 years of enslavement as well as uh, exploitation of our indigenous populations, a similar kind of uh, ethics of justice and uh, spatial justice in particular arises um, for Europe and Australia and much of the world concerning refugee crises, um, though 
perhaps uh, in the EU at present, we're mostly dealing with the refugees of war. Uh, uh, as Mike just demonstrated, we're going to have also environmental refugees on uh, across the world. And all of us as architects are um, going to be pressed into thinking about how we situate, locate, and house these refugees. And I think we often imagine that um, the role of architecture is merely as shelter, but I want to suggest that this it goes much further than that. And this um, small refugee arrival pavilion that was done by architecture students is an indication of how architecture can dignify what's otherwise a dehumanizing experience. So with those as starting points, and maybe as an example of the way my own research operates, which is through case examples that expound upon much uh, larger and more difficult to grasp kinds of uh, concepts and theories, I'd like to offer uh, humbly a manifesto for spatial justice in architecture. Uh, for us to advance spatial justice in architecture and urban design means uh, interrogating and undoing the whiteness of our history, leveraging design to open paths toward the world we want to live in, creating what I'm going to call radically public buildings and cities, and by doing that by addressing critical junctures. I'm only going to talk about these four aspects or principles. Uh, these are or chapters basically in the book that I'm working on, and the lower three are um, ones I won't discuss this evening. But to begin, I just want to think about what it me what I'm talking about as spatial justice, and this really comes from the work of geographers like David Harvey and Ed Soja, that justice too has a geography, that equitable distribution and access to the city, its resources, services, and amenities are basic human rights, so that spatial strategies of design and planning can counteract urban injustice. And here you see a, what is now horrifyingly a typical scene in many parts of Los Angeles where we have uh, 70,000 people living unsheltered in a context where half a million properties are zoned for single families, which we now understand is part of a legacy of systemic white supremacy. So, just thinking about undoing the whiteness of architecture's own history, um, by that I mean not a, a Caucasian race, but whiteness, which is the normalization of white identities by which non-white lives are seen as inferior. And this is a kind of systemic, uh, systemically permeates architecture. Uh, Mabel Wilson says, and she uses the Bannister Fletcher tree of architecture as an example, that the very term architecture uh, embeds the closure of those building traditions outside classical European history. And you can see in the tree that all of those lower branches where Mexican, Peruvian, Egyptian, Indian, Assyrian, Chinese, and Japanese lumped into one are all cut off from further growth. And only the um, Anglo-European uh, trunk and its branches survive in our own architectural history. So there's always been resistance to this, of course, and at no time uh, more so than now. Uh, one of the primary principles of an architecture and urbanism of spatial justice is that in our own practices, we leverage design in order to affect change. Um, though transformative change happens in multiple ways, we as architects and designers are most likely to contribute to the kind of change we wanna see when we deploy our own expertise at the most creative and high levels possible. And to embody this principle, I'll show you the um, project that Tom referred to in the introduction, which we called Backyard Homes, which led to state level policy. And this really was a 10-year uh, set of research initiatives uh, 
grounded in Los Angeles, which from the photos you've already seen is kind of the mother of all suburbs and in a way a perfect test bed for trying to think about how to deal with the post-suburban city. In the yellow uh, typical land use map you see on the upper left, that is the single family zone in Los Angeles, where something like 80% of our uh, land use sites are for single families. And yet this has been resisted um, by uh, in various neighborhoods for a very long time. Um, we started by studying those neighborhoods, one of which, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. So in this particular neighborhood, you can see in the aerial view that some of the lots have uh, very little behind the primary house, but others have already informally and illegally built multiple units, as many as three in their yards. And so we began to study how this um, informal bottom-up um, indigenous practice was occurring and to see if we couldn't get local codes to change to incentivize this kind of development and make it legal. We looked, for instance, at corner lots uh, long and large lots and alley lots, and alleys is the one that's look, uh, shown here on the right, just as a principle that we might, in the 900 miles of alleys that exist in Los Angeles, uh, re-green them by the buildings that we build along the alley, uh, make them safer and um, add solar uh, harvesting in the backyards as a means to incentivize the doubling of the density along um, alley lots. Sorry, I keep trying to click forward. Um, we studied lot types, uh, not a typical kind of spatial survey across the city of Los Angeles to see which types of lot, lots um, might accommodate what kinds of secondary units or accessory dwelling units. We also studied neighbors and neighborhood groups to try to find what their priorities were. We looked at through field surveys um, how uh, secondary units were already being built. And we studied various kinds of building technologies to see in these kind of uh, difficult to access sites, whether we could build in an environmentally sustainable way. This was really looking at very lightweight construction and we built a demonstration house uh, on the UCLA campus reflecting this idea. And I would just want to suggest that leveraging design for these kinds of large scale changes can start with a very small increment. Well, this was, um, uh, in fact, did lead to uh, our being able to co-author state legislation that effectively unleashed as many as 8 million uh, backyards for secondary units, effectively ending single family zoning. Uh, it has really progressed far beyond this now. Um, our most recent legislation, uh, which was a follow on to uh, not just doubling the density of the single family zone, but adding a third unit. Now it's possible to break lots into two, each one being able to be owned rather than rental alone, and each one of those lots having an extra unit. So we could basically get four units on a single family lot. Um, and you can also see that this has actually had architectural repercussions as well. Uh, these are projects that are now standard plans within the city building department where uh, people can expedite the building process as well as get more affordable um, architectural planning services. Another principle um, in this manifesto for spatial justice is that we might rethink our organization of architecture from being around projects to being around these series of uh, commissions, series of linked initiatives that serve a radically public purpose. And for this, I'd just like to um, uh, 
remind you, because we've all seen these images extensively of Alejandro Aravena and Elemental's half houses, um, which were developed um, as an affordable housing replacement for informal settlements. I think uh, it, there are two aspects of the half houses that are particularly useful. One is the embedding of this solution in the engagement of the very people who will live here, the publics who will in fact be evolving and using these houses who argued not to be moved to the periphery as is often the case in the Mexico City kinds of projects where center city uh, informal settlements are displaced and moved outside. These residents argued effectively that they would rather get half of a house than to have a whole house outside the city. And Aravena then developed a prototype that could proliferate, um, organized around collective courtyards, a kind of public space uh, that then would be finished by the residents, as you see in this photograph. That um, their own office elemental has done four of these projects. And I think uh, importantly published all the drawings in an open access format so that anyone who wants to use or generate another kind of half house has the experience of elemental in hand. And in that sense uh, is not working on the old model of a kind of neoliberal commission basis, but on the basis of some th something much more radical and uh, publicly accessible. The last uh, principle I'm going to describe here today is that we um, take advantage and recognize how transformation is most possible at critical junctures. And we've had this concept circulating in literature for a long time. But for us in architecture, shared trauma or crisis gives rise to architecture's transformative capacities on behalf of spatial justice, so that it's at this breaking point, new collective possibilities can form. And here, I'm gonna show you the um, work of a number of architects, uh, Hitoshi Abe, Toyo Ito, and Yasuaki Onoda in their work in the post 311 uh, tsunami region of Japan. Um, so the national government's response was immediate and swift and efficient of supplying temporary housing units that would have no more than a five-year lifespan. There were all kinds of uh, very clear uh, processes put in place, but not a single architect was engaged in that rebuilding process. It was all to be done by engineers. And the Japanese architects, primarily through Archie Aid, which was uh, Abe and Onoda's group, um, as well as something called Homes for All, which Toyo Ito organized, interjected in this national and engineering process to help the um, temporary and emergency housing residents have a voice in their own uh, communities as they're being rebuilt after the tsunami. And you see um, one of the kinds of projects that was done um, in the uh, prefecture uh, where Manabu Chiba was working to try to create a collective space in the city and rather than one that most and only responds to potentially new tsunamis, which was the government plan. Um, Archie Aid went to the various uh, emergency shelter areas, that, which were all organized around individual houses. There were no public spaces in the refugee settlements. They uh, drew people together. And in particular, they were speaking with women and youth, uh, voices that are sometimes marginalized in uh, Japanese governmental processes to try to find the ways in which these uh, settlements and their inhabitants would want to be rehoused uh, safely, but also in connection with their um, original economies, primarily related to fishing and to the sea. And they developed drawings like these that the um, village representatives were able to take to the government to reshape the engineering plans into ones that were more humane and habitable from the residents' perspectives. The other primary effort in the 
post tsunami efforts were these homes for all which Toyoito's group organized and these really became the uh, sort of architectural contributions to the mass product produced uh, emergency shelters so that each of those um, shelter zones had in fact a gathering place and that it was dignified through careful architectural attention. These became so well loved that many of them were preserved even after uh, towns and villages were rebuilt so that communities could gather for gardening or for meeting or uh, as a childcare center in the heart of the emergency shelter um, developments. Um, in closing, I just want to uh, like share credit with my city lab team. Our practices form the for the foundation for the spatial justice manifesto that I was just describing to you, which we continue to refine uh, and critique and practice ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. That, that's wonderful. Um, thanks for setting out your, your agenda or manifesto in a stronger sense of spatial justice. Uh, certainly, at least in the US, has been um, the context has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and, you know, even while it's at the same time, I think that there's a consciousness that has been uh, stimulated uh, as a result of. of uh, stresses that society has been under. Um, Most every of the case of the crises that you might describe uh, at the heart of spatial justice and social justice movements have been exacerbated through the pandemic. So it's made the bar relief much more defined. Uh, certainly the, the bottom up processes that you work on, um, you know, long before the pandemic uh, are a really powerful mode of uh, engagement uh, and potentially for the kind of critical junctures that we're in right now, the multiple critical junctures yeah. are a way forward. Um, I'm sure we can uh, get to get more more detailed and involved in, in a discussion uh, after our last presentation um, by Neville Mars. Uh, Dr. Neville, Neville Mars joins us uh, as director of Dynamic City Foundation in Shanghai. Um, Neville Mars is a uh, Dutch architect and planner and principal of Mars Architects based in Shanghai. Mars Architects is a winning designs, uh, award winning design studio uh, with 20 years of experience in Asia. Um, they have a strong focus on sustainability planning and, has de and they've developed over a, a dozen integrated planning projects across Asia, including the master plan of Mumbai, the strategic master plan of sustainable Pudong, Pudong 2040 and the Comprehensive Land Use Plan of Tacloban in the Philippines. For the coming year, Mars has been granted funding for a large scale study, Metro Java 2045, using big data uh, and grassroots collaborative planning methods to build a resilient post COVID uh, rural megalopolis. Uh, join us uh, to welcome Neville Mars. Thank you very much for joining us, Neville. Hi, good morning, everybody. Morning. So nice to be back on your panel, Tom, and you're always way too generous with your introductions. Um, I am going to talk about the last project you mentioned. Uh, let me try and share my screen. Let's see. Um, indeed, we are working on a project in Java which is, um, I think, relevant to the discussion today because the ambition is to design this kind of uh, post-COVID um, metropolis, which is indeed an agricultural uh, metropolis. However, we've kind of encountered um, some really fundamental challenges in, in doing so. And um, these challenges, they go to the heart of, of the planning discipline. And indeed, uh, to uh, they touch upon the issues raised, uh, raised today. Um, it's this kind of weird binary condition that um, the discipline seems to be at, 
in a dichotomy between top down and bottom up, between formal and informal, and there's very little uh, by means of um, integrating these two. So that's been our, our biggest challenge. Um, you are all uh, familiar with, with the kind of rather harsh break between global generic uh, top down um, ambitions, the uh, ones that are able to tap into global funding streams um, that follow narratives of nation building versus the other one, the local, the bottom up, the community building, as we just saw some beautiful examples of. Um, the reality is that I believe that that really introduces a schism at the heart of um, the design practice, uh, specifically uh, large scale urban planning, one that drives um, uh, a schism between urban theory as we want to design cities and the real practice. Um, one that is not easily uh, addressed, as I will uh, try to argue, because we're encountering some very practical um, challenges. So we all know the reality of these kind of top-down uh, global, dare I say, generic um, urbanisms. This is Shanghai. Uh, I have to admit somebody, I think. One second, yeah. Um, the, this global urbanism is related to uh, a type of uh, framework of large roads, of repetition, of building capacity. This is um, Ordos still kind of unfolding. You literally see the, the road grid being projected onto the map. Um, into infinity. On the other hand, we are familiar with the images of kind of this um, rather um, generic, globally generic uh, top-down urbanism, which has um, proven to be uh, at least as resilient, if not uh, more successful in some cases. Uh, in the case of Mumbai, where we worked quite a bit, um, we've encountered that indeed the informal settlements are beginning to kind of um, merge together, form larger networks, incorporating as many as uh, 7 million people. So we effectively have uh, the city of London sort of embedded within uh, the Mumbai island city. Here, all the gray is uh, informal settlement. Um, this kind of hybrid condition, I would argue, is really what uh, underlies the success of many cities. This is Shenzhen, which is often um, kind of lauded as the epitome of uh, the Chinese success story, of Chinese urbanism, of top-down uh, centralized planning. Well, in reality, if we look at the map, this is uh, the urban part. The green is effectively just mountain because everything not on the, uh, the mountain is already uh, fully urbanized. Within it, there is, um, there is a large part specifically on the north here in orange and, and red that, is, uh, that are um, urban villages. So they are um, self-built or uh, pre-existing uh, structures that account for exactly half of the population. So within this sort of beautiful formal city of glass and concrete, um, in reality, most people are able to um, afford living there because they have access to these informal structures that are hyper dense, of course, the, the handshake homes allow you to literally reach out to your neighbor. Um, that offer uh, a diversity of program locally at your doorstep um, that really offer a counterpoint to this formal city. Um, in, in Guangzhou and other places in the Pearl River Delta, uh, this is what that kind of structure um, looks like. The morphology is, is really uh, truly um, uh, kind of inspiring because at the, at the street level, if I click through quickly, at the street level, um, there's these beautiful patches of agricultural fields that um, have sustained these villages. So it's a true hybrid, not just between planned and unplanned, but between um, uh, urban and rural. That kind of uh, hybrid 
condition, I would argue, is um, really what sustains this this um, megalopolis of, of Shenzhen and the Pearl River uh, Delta at, at large. Now, um, it seems also, according to the um, World Bank, that um, that is a driving urbanization uh, force. In fact, of the two million we heard, uh, two billion uh, we heard earlier, one billion will probably emerge in these kind of peri-urban uh, conditions, be it in uh, Latin America, be it in uh, Southeast Asia or Africa. Um, the largest growing um, spurt is actually happening right here. Um, in, in Asia and Southeast Asia. The um, most unique form of this hybridization, if you will, is specifically uh, on the island of Java here at the, in, the, in the bottom. If we zoom in a little bit, it's there where I believe um, all these uh, uh, conflicts come to the fore. Um, as we're trying to kind of address uh, how to begin even to design for uh, that kind of rural landscape. Um, let me reiterate what, what the, the, the technical challenges are, sort of uh, planning technical challenges. So on the one hand, currently it seems impossible to connect um, the top-down planning visions, which are absolutely needed in Java, um, in, in Indonesia at large, but Java specifically with um, 150 million people um, on one island. They are currently rolling out a large um, planning vision, building uh, many tollways, et cetera, harbors, airports. Um, it seems technically almost impossible to inform that large macro vision with um, bottom-up uh, localized um, uh, um, feedback. There is a, there's a disconnect there. So um, in general, you could argue there is a disconnect between the urban and the rural and between the planned and the unplanned. Um, the project is, is Metro Java 2045. Um, we, we have put some things online if you're interested. Um, the, the challenge we are looking at is specifically at the very center here in central Java, um, where you see uh, very similar to China that there has been a reverse migration. Um, so it is, there, it's a sort of a doorstep or, or a brickification of the countryside, which is already uh, extremely dense. Here you see the morphology just north of Jogjakarta. Jogjakarta is uh, this, this core here at the bottom of the image. And it kind of, um, kind of permeates into the countryside um, in what is, uh, is being termed by, um, by Terry McGee as, as the Dessa Kota, right? Dessa uh, and Kota contraction of city and village. Um, how is that? reverse migration now shaping this landscape and how can we as planners respond to that? That's kind of, kind of the critical question for me at this point. On the one hand, we see a sort of a traditional expansion, outward growth of the city. On the other hand, a kind of implosion uh, along the lines of um, the Chinese Taobao villages where there is production, um, very often informal um, industrialization, Kind of spreading across the countryside. So um, I've been considering this uh, this challenge in a, in a sort of doom dream uh, scenario, where the Desakota in its earliest stage as a, as a productive landscape that was completely autarkic, self able to sustain itself uh, in a, in an ecological way, we now face this kind of uh, junction where on the one hand. Um, the landscape might be highly fragmented. Uh, it is already dispersed, um, but as these pockets of industrialization and urbanization kind of uh, land on the map, you get a new hybrid, uh, a hybrid where the, the planned, the, the generic, the global city kind of finds its way, eats its way into this uh, rural environment. So uh, that comes with an, a whole range of, of challenges that are all correlated. 
Uh, but in a nutshell, um, I, would, I would argue uh, the two scenarios revolve around either, on the one hand, road proliferation, which um, is argued to be a good thing um, locally by local governments across uh, Southeast Asia, because many of these uh, rural communities are still very inaccessible, um, versus um, really a, a type of um, road development that is driving this suburbanization that is driving the fragmentation and ultimately even alienation as uh, communities are being severed and ecologies are being severed. So the, the counterpoint to that is some sort, some form of integrated land use planning, um, which is a wonderful a mouthful, but um, it seems technically really truly quite uh, challenging. So let's um, look at some of the issues I've been, I've been uh, struggling with. This is the area of uh, central Java. That's the Borobudur. This is a general density curve. So there is some, uh, there is some, uh, there are some intensities within this map, mainly Jogjakarta and Semarang uh, on the north and the south. Um, within that landscape, if we um, kind of see how, um, oh, sorry. If we see how uh, these corridors are now being connected, there is um, a kind of a suburbanization occurring between these main uh, urban cores, um, which uh, are accelerated by the arrival of um, a new uh, international airport, uh, new uh, train and road lines, and uh, an opening up of the Borobudur here, sort of indicated with a pyramid. So we create a kind of a field condition, which kind of loses, um, I would argue, the qualities of the traditional uh, Desa Kota, um, which loses the quality of uh, the autarkic productive landscape, uh, and instead is creating um, a hybrid condition that puts a huge amount of a new pressure on a very uh, intricate fine grain road system. So as these um, areas are, are industrializing, um, the traditional uh, small, uh, even half lane roads that have sustained this uh, morphology uh, suddenly have to um, uh, have trucks and, and, and lorries uh, uh, kind of in great numbers serving them. So um, the, the very complexity of this landscape combining folding kind of uh, historically urban agricultural and nat natural components into one system uh, also makes it very hard to analyze and, and understand what's, uh, what's even uh, going on, how the system works. So we were uh, forced to develop a model um, which seems to be rather um, uh, uncommon, where um, urban and non-urban components are understood within one model. So let's just say red for urban, green for uh, agriculture, and blue for uh, natural systems. So this um, RGB model has to somehow, um, has to somehow, darling, um, incorporate um, the, the, the planned and the unplanned as we move to the future and see more of these uh, industrial uh, components entering. I um, introduced this notion of contiguousness as the, the landscape, um, let me go back one more to sh show you, as the landscape shows it's a very striated uh, system. So it, the very connectedness of this space seems to be at the heart of, of its success. Um, so introducing new elements kind of begins to cut that, that these striations. Um, to that end, it is really about, um, on the one end, allowing for development because progress is necessary and uh, there is a need for growth. But on the other hand, could that be done without um, inflicting too much damage on, on this very fragile uh, landscape? So the first step has been to um, introduce a sort of a taxonomy, uh, a catalog of uh, land use types. So um, first we started rather crudely, sort of mapping them um, uh, by hand, 
figuring out what was going on. Uh, for instance, um, areas with uh, uh, more urban components, areas with more uh, natural components, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, also looking at the type of morphologies that they generate. But uh, it really became clear that that didn't deliver uh, a, an accurate and objective um, kind of picture. So we, we started using GIS as a means to uh, differentiate between uh, different areas of heterogeneity. So every cluster we, we now distill has uh, red and green and blue in it, but in different uh, proportions. So uh, that delivers these kinds, kinds of maps um, where you see uh, different uh, colors that, that represent either um, more urban or more rural areas um, and, and, and different, um, in different, uh, uh, and different slopes of the topography. So by including the slope and the water, in this case, you see here the watersheds in white, um, it actually reflects how the landscape was, uh, has traditionally been used. Um, the higher the slope, the more difficult, of course, it is to, uh, to grow a rice. Um, and the lower into the valley, the better access to, to water. So this kind of differentiation uh, slowly begins to um, create larger pockets that we can uh, distill. Um, meaning that within one of these color zones, we can uh, formulate one type of uh, strategic response that then can be um, replicated, uh, hopefully uh, bottom up. Um, here you see rather beautifully the, the waterways flowing from these, um, from the volcanoes down to the valleys. So um, in in this kind of um, patchwork, we have to then begin to connect the macro and the micro. So the project has to kind of slowly zoom in. In this case, uh, the larger square you see is 100 by 130 kilometers, but the small cube uh, in the center here, that is the Borbudur, uh, is 10 by 10 uh, kilometers. So um, this cross scalar approach really means that if we have um, uh, formulated a st strategy for the Borbodur, it could, as you see, it's largely orange here, it could then be, um, be, be applied in villages throughout that uh, dark, uh, dark orange uh, region. So we've kind of isolated one of these um, uh, land use types within our catalog of, of typologies. And then the second step is to look at the, um, the road system. As mentioned, it's extremely um, intricate, it's, it's extremely fine grain, and uh, we use uh, GIS to uh, begin to interpret um, how this uh, really complex network works. Unlike the generic global urbanism, um, it lacks uh, almost any hierarchy. Um, where the traditional planner would, would try to achieve some sort of tree structure from uh, your tollway uh, down to your local street. Um, here it is level, it's flush, it's, um, it's a field condition. So how do you even begin to um, uh, kind of frame your, your, your uh, area of research? So in this case, um, we looked at the planning of a toll road between uh, Semarang and uh, Jogjakarta, and we um, analyzed a one-hour uh, travel envelope between these two cities. And uh, interestingly enough, um, it, re it kind of creates this, this uh, rather intriguing loop around the volcano. So within this loop, you can reach um, any point uh, within one hour. Uh, let me See, if you project that onto the land use map on the left here, you can already begin to see that these, uh, su surprisingly, they kind of coincide with one another. The orange um, land use map and the white envelope of uh, our uh, one hour city, if you will, kind of uh, begin to uh, overlap. 
Uh, here you see in, in, in uh, more detail what that means for the settlements. This extremely uh, intricate pattern of, of settlements uh, is more intensely connected in these darker uh, regions. And those are exactly the regions um, as we try to uh, test, uh, because that big data is, is very often, uh, as all of you know, uh, a very misleading. Um, it, it is very persuasive um, and it generates interesting uh, diagrams. But on the other hand, does it really tell uh, the story of what's going on uh, at, the, at the street level, at the micro level? So we've been doing these samplings and um, indeed where the connectivity is highest, that's exactly where this kind of sprawl condition, this micro sprawl below the radar developments are uh, happening uh, the fastest. So one of these um, places we um, have kind of zoomed in is the Borobudur. Um, here is a, the 10 by 10 uh, site for our pilot project um, in sort of the third and final stage of this, of this process is that we, when Indonesia opens up again, um, go, to, um, go to the site and have uh, workshop with, uh, workshops with these villages uh, to kind of generate the, the actual um, planning strategy. Um, that would happen here in the, in the Borobudur area. On the left, you see uh, the temple structure, just indicated by a little uh, dot to give you a sense of where we are. Um, on the right are all the built structures um, from before 2005. However, if we look at what happened since 2005, um, a rather um, a significant development has taken place without uh, anybody taking notice. This is the, the new buildings by 2011. These are the new buildings by 2015, 2017, 2020. And if you put those all together, you get this um, kind of matrix pattern, uh, which is really rather daunting. So uh, between um, 2005 and 2020, in 15 short years, uh, the existing footprint, I would say, uh, increased by about 70%. Um, if we isolate those, I put it against the back black round to give it a bit of contrast, uh, you see what kind of um, topography that, that generates. Uh, it is indeed uh, a, a kind of almost like a, a mist-like um, uh, urbanization. Um, I would argue that each of these buildings has its own small sphere uh, of influence. That means that this is the current um, actual urban footprint with the white dot being the Borobudur again. So uh, an intriguing uh, uh, yet rather um, disconcerting uh, urban pattern. Uh, moving towards 2030, um, it's easy to assume we are going to a sort of a, a ubiquitous um, tapestry of, of uh, casual um, urbanization for this region. So we haven't um, started to develop uh, um, uh, concrete planning strategies, but I'll indicate a, a few ideas. Um, simply, we don't want to come with, with preconceived ideas before actually being able to move to the, to the site and talk to local communities. Um, but an obvious idea seems to be that we have um, this kind of um, dichotomy between uh, on the one hand the villages here on the left uh, on the other hand the increasingly um, upgraded road system uh, so there is a sort of a pedestrian world and there is a, a new world of, of the car and car ownership is uh, of course rapidly um, increasing so could we begin to introduce um, more uh, classical uh, planning concepts such as, such as a walkable uh, city to to address this uh, this condition uh, make all these um, uh, rather um, beautiful little pockets of development completely uh, a pedestrian here you see on the right uh, what kind of uh, access that would grant um, and on the other hand um, that would open up <coughs> excuse me that would open up um, 
the this pedestrian world to the ecological underlayer of this uh, of this area, uh, which is very rich because um, even close to uh, this World Heritage Monument, uh, there is farming, uh, there is nature, there are rivers. Uh, so it is still a very um, a truly Desacota uh, uh, productive landscape. So you would have um, room to grow, room to develop, room to absorb. Um, I don't want to sound too optimistic, but yes, room to uh, absorb um, well, global tourism flows when indeed the highway opens up. You see the red here at the top left. Um, and when the airport connects directly to, our, to the Borobudur and, and, and the COVID um, uh, restrictions have been lifted. But on the other hand, uh, you would be able to uh, maintain and preserve uh, this green envelope on the right. So um, that's, that's my, my ambition. Uh, I, at least I hope the, the, the challenges uh, are clear and how uh, data um, offers some new insights, but is only really valuable uh, when I'm able to take that um, into um, uh, my suitcase to to the uh, local communities and and work with uh, local uh, academia to um, to kind of develop actionable uh, strategies. If that works out, then um, the condition of the Borobudur here on the left. Um, could indeed uh, be a scalable model for much of these rural areas in uh, in Java. Thank you. Let's let's leave it at, at that for now. Oh yeah, my my few words of Indonesian. Thank you very much, Neville. That, that's uh, we're we're overloaded with uh, wonderful information. Um, we we will we'll soon open it up maybe to some questions uh, if. Uh, if you want to have a question in the chat, we can open that up in a, in a bit. Uh, the first question, this is a great moment to end uh, and, and hinge into a set of questions around, uh, I guess it's what happens if Neville cannot go to the village. Um, in a way, architecture has been a, a, a tool of you know, global capitalism, uh, a real estate in its most commodified form. Um, you know, in the way that, that architecture is practiced in a globalized field. And this has been, uh, to use Don Bates's terminology, normal uh, for some time for an investor to be based in one country or city, a project in another, and the architect and consultants in a third or fourth location. How viable is this current model of architectural practice? I mean, certainly in the pandemic, it's stressed and strained. Um, and what if we don't return to the patterns of flow that we used to call normal? Uh, what would architectural practice look like in the near and, and longer term future um, if architects can still build internationally? And what happens if we're uh, reassigned, so to speak, to work locally and regionally? Will we have uh, greater influence locally? Will our capacity to affect bottom up change uh, be augmented by a shift away from international forms of practice to a more locally based patterns of architectural engagement. So I guess in short, I, I ask what happens if Neville can't go to the village uh, in, in, in short? That's an open question. It, it can be for Neville, it can be for, for any. Well, um, I, I don't think I can answer that question exactly, Tom, but I, I, it, it does lead to, I mean, certainly when I was putting my uh, presentation together, and, and this is, to be honest, it's been something going on at least since about June of last year, is, uh, you know, we, we know well the uh, uh, effects of this disruption through the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and this, it, there has been continually since about uh, May of last year, I uh, hope to get back to normal as soon as possible. And it's, for me at least, it's been constantly uh, uh, deferred and deferred and deferred and deferred. But in the rush to normal, I, I, one of the things we keep asking ourselves, at least at our university, is actually what have we gained out of the pandemic? Not what have we lost that we're trying to return to, but what have we gained? And so 
you know, that question, and, and this was something I, I took a lot from uh, Dana's presentation uh, about questions of inequity. And, uh, you know, we've seen, at least in Australia, that um, inequity has both increased in some aspects, but also decreased in some aspects. That is to say, there are lots of families that have never had so much time with husbands and wives and children as during the pandemic because they had to work from home. Now, that's also put huge pressures, particularly on uh, primarily on women, uh, that they both have to be the mother and also try to do their, their job from home. Uh, and often the father gets a spare room to use as his office and such. But at the same time, it has meant that there's been a reevaluation of the kind of commuting cycle of getting up early in the morning, driving for an hour and a half into work, working in the office, and then spending an hour and a half coming home again. Uh, and, and, you know, from our point of view, also just in, in terms of teaching, uh, it was painful to have to suddenly go online. But at the same time, we realized there were actually some real advantages to being able to offer online, just like this event today. You know, we would never have been able to, you know, or it would have been hard to get four people from four corners of the world together in one room without spending a lot of money on airfares and hotels. And here we just did it by logging in. So I guess I, all I'm trying to say is I think in, in the, in the, from my point of view, in the rush to return to normal is uh, an absolute, uh, you know, appeal to try to say, well, what were the benefits of the pandemic? What did it allow us to do? What did it, as a disruptive event, what did it make us think about differently that we wouldn't if we weren't disrupted? There's another aspect of your question too, Tom, that I think is um, kind of tied to what Don was just saying. And that is that we both, it's kind of like the local global dichotomy that we've long understood as essential to globalization. We now as architects to have agency that's got an ethical component have to have local on the ground partners because we can't do that all the time. Uh, if Neville doesn't get back to the village, he's got to get villagers, whether they're academics or inhabitants to partner with him. And I think the interesting thing for our profession about that is that it really recognizes uh, expertise that we often have marginalized. So the fact that local knowledge is essential to being able to operate effectively as an architect could come from many local sources and the formalization of that as part of our disciplinary practices, I think, um, it is a kind of what one thing we gain from pandemic pressures. At City Lab, we've developed all kinds of new methods in order to do community engagement throughout the pandemic that have really tested our understanding of what we mean by co-creation or sharing knowledge or, um, you know, I don't know, everything from something we call thick mapping to sending to, to talking and having translators in Korean, Spanish, and English working on group meetings, uh, which is definitely a challenge, but it's not impossible. The, um, the critical junctures that Dana, you talked about, uh, they're, they're uh, there are multiple critical junctures that we're currently experienced even before the pandemic about whether whether it's the the, the background or the more um, uh, issues about social equity but certainly the the planet's ecology um, in the past in in several uh, uh, decades or even a couple of centuries of, of urbanism as we kind of understand it today you know, bad stuff has been followed by massive changes and um, these transformations, which are often seen as positive. Um, I'd like to press this point about what good has come out of the pandemic, because I think it's it's a better question than, than what I might want to ask next. Um, uh, Mike, you had uh, painted this incredibly dark uh, context, yet um, have uh, a great optimism about how um, 
we can mitigate them with um, surfing all that complexity. Um, you didn't address terribly much about the pandemic and, it, and as a context. Uh, could you speculate a little bit about what, what uh, um, yes, I, I, it might come out? Oh, well, work has mainly been, I mean, our kind of smallest unit of time is 10 years, but but in a kind of medium scale is 50 years. Um, I do think that the positive thing that comes out, uh, I remember participatory planning, at least that's how architects call it. I don't know if planners do, um, where there's a strong uh, community engagement in, in the uh, planning process. Um, the the first thing thing that we think of uh, in our kind of privileged technical position, and of course, is you know completely facilitated or enabled by what we've been through, and we've all learned how to do that. Um, the the difficulty with that argument, I think, uh, particularly in in places like Java, is that. Um, you know the computation, the access to uh, the technology for communication it is quite poor. Um, I think, in terms of how well organised and well funded um, architectural practices work, is very different. I, I have a few former graduates in Indonesia um, who have established practices. Um, so the scale of the work they do on the one hand is, you know, very large projects that have to be done in a very short time because that's always a feature of uh, rapidly, rapidly expanding um, economies that are under high population pressure. Um, but the, the technology that goes with it, I think, is currently not evenly distributed. And, and that remains an issue. I, I do agree with you that if you take a historical view, when there have been small collapses, uh, there have been profound change afterwards. Um, but, but I think COVID is actually a symptom of uh, collapse rather than the collapse itself uh, or, or impending crisis. Uh, I'm struck with the, the analysis uh, that uh, Neville was showing of what I would think of as a network analysis and topological one, it, it is computational, but to do that on foot uh, around that area, where I think if I remember from my childhood of being uh, visiting Java would be very difficult. Um, I think it's also that um, kind of donut shaped network is right on the boundary between if I'm right, Eastern and Western Java and the 10 year drought, uh, which is projected to be very severe in Java in, in 20 to 30 years time is going to be predominantly on the Western end of Java. Um, so I think that the knowledge systems are global. That's, I guess what I'm saying. Uh, and, and the bigger data about projected change and analytical modes is, is global. But the production of architecture, the making of it, it, it is profoundly local, and the more so uh, in cases um, that never, like Neville's practice, where there's a concern to preserve or conserve something about um, cultural occupation of a landscape. I don't know if that's. I'm just. Yeah, let me chime in. You, you. Um... You hit the nail on the head, and and um, Dana also introduced this 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 point. Um, so this is exactly um, sort of my my challenge at the moment. Um, we've as we are postponing um, or prolonging the project, and we're working online. Um, more and more um, is established with with the academia, and that works really well. Uh, they do have the means of communication, and they do have. Um, very sophisticated tools and they understand uh, our uh, objectives. Um, but as, as Dana mentioned, a lot of uh, local knowledge needs to be incorporated within um, this larger structure. It is actually uh, kind of at the heart of the project is to 
kind of cross connect um, these these local initiatives. Um, uh, they they share. Uh, you also allude to that, Mike. The, this this kind of uh, challenge of, of um, the 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 um, co collective resources are being um, misused because there's there's no uh, transparency. Um, there's there's only um, sort of opportunistic uh, development. So if we through um, open platforms are able to share uh, between uh, even neighboring communities. That's, that's a huge step. And the, the land use mappings we've done, uh, they begin to kind of um, demarcate areas of shared challenges, uh, very much uh, around resources of, of, of water um, specifically. Um, so it's, it's interesting that it's, um, it's a little bit maybe more uh, specific. Um, there is a capacity on the ground very often um, maybe not in the village, but in townships, they have planning capacity. They even work with GIS. I mean, somebody needs to uh, make sure that that newly planned toll road lands exactly at the right spot. So those those tools are available, um, but they're very much uh, just like here in China. They're 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 very much being uh, applied. Uh, top down to just uh, receive the message from higher up and then kind of um, once funding has been uh, has been uh, uh, allocated to actually execute. So there's no uh, feedback that that goes back up the chain of command. Um, and in, in that sense, uh, I really believe uh, uh, my role and there I'm, I'm the only white person in, in, in my, my team. Uh, to, to, to be blunt, um, um, we, I see my role as, as, uh, and my team's role as, as really a mediator. Um, uh, that local knowledge is now somewhat stagnant and, and it needs to begin to travel, it needs to begin to uh, connect and it needs to begin, sorry, I will pass on the, the, the baton to somebody because my daughter is off to school, but um, yeah, that's that's what I hope um, we we are able to um, to achieve. The, the the truth be told, the the big data research um, it doesn't communicate well with local communities. I've seen that in other projects. Um, in fact, um, for instance, uh, we we did this project in the Philippines. <clears throat> Where we built um, a new city that was ravaged by 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 uh, Tacloba, by um, by Yolanda, the typhoon. Big data is often being used; it's, it's almost weaponized. Um, uh, so, uh, big developers or or worse, um, uh, national institutions that kind of come in um, with huge amounts of of, of uh, graphs and data. Uh, to kind of convince uh, local mayors that there has to be a new uh, mega dam that cuts right through the through the city, um, or a new highway, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and these are obvious obviously projects that have political uh, face. You know, um, the proposals we do are are so subtle. It's very often quite hard to um, to to give to give that. That clear image of, of how that's going to help against a flood or how that's going to help uh, to to kind of create better crop etc. They they are um, they are too um, they are they are not uh, blunt enough. Mm. Peace has returned to you. Sorry about that. <laughs> we um, we tend to to think that we uh, we as a kind of more enlightened uh, architectural or urban urbanist community. Uh, have um, great benefits for um, uh, uh, rather than uh, really recognizing um, that urban development, urbanization, building construction is one of the biggest culprits of, you know, the, uh, of, of making our planet more toxic. Um, in which ways can, you know, the, the model of globalization and all of its damage um, uh, reconcile sustainability? or urbanization and our planetary ecology, uh, or technology, as, as you're saying, um, Neville, um, reconcile natural processes. Um, these, are, these are questions which sort of, uh, I, I, I think as much as they're rhetorical, 
they're also trying to negotiate a world which um, as much as we, we aim for amelioration, we're part of the problem as much as we are part of the solution. Yeah, sadly, that's true. Hmm. I'm really struggling with this. My, my, um, I've no, I've nothing to contribute other than I, I walk on eggs constantly because every, every um, proposed um, new settlement or even a uh, smaller project is a new uh, instance for uh, kind of unwanted development. Uh, the, the, the progress uh, preservation uh, dichotomy is, is terribly difficult. Well, it's, I think, part of our new reimagining of our profession, which is how, how does it contribute to healing, whether it's the planet or communities, rather than uh, further destruction. And, and it is, I don't know, this summer was really the summer when the reckoning happened, I think, uh, at least in the United States. I mean, not only do we have our you know, sort of clear social justice uh, and injustices laid out before us, but the climate conditions were uh, undeniable. And I think, you know, you're really pointing to a hinge in architecture and urban design. Like how do we say, take the micro transformations that you were looking at Neville and figure out if there's a role for us in that. It's not so clear what our role would be um, if, if the same kind of process that you see of population growth within existing fabrics isn't so dissimilar from what uh, we look at at the suburbs where informal development is happening in the backyards, um, that doesn't, that's not a necessarily a, the solution. It's just an indication of the direction and just how we, uh, if we have something to contribute to that, it's going to require a different kind of thinking than developmentalism, that's for sure. Uh, uh, Donald Bates uh, had to join uh, his, uh, his agenda and schedule for uh, the morning in, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and I understand that, Michael, you're also sort of getting, getting to uh, uh, sort of yes. midnight in, in the UK. Um, we do have, uh, if, if you do need to leave, that's absolutely understandable. <laughs> it's very difficult to get um, 24 hours of time zones together uh, to make it uh, uh, convenient for everybody. Uh, okay, well, I just wanted to say it's been uh, a really thoughtful and enjoyable event, and it's, it's good to hear very different perspectives and uh, work than, than I do uh, and to see the possible connections between uh, what, what are quite different uh, understandings of the world and quite different ways of working in it. So thank you. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate your presentation, your contribution. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. All the best. Um, Perhaps we have uh, time for one question uh, or two questions from uh, our audience. Um, we have a question in the chat. Uh, how do we as professionals justify global practice of architecture and urbanism while also knowing architecture and urban design's role in the processes of cultural production in far-flung locales? Does our professional expertise presuppose that we as global practitioners know better than local communities? Um, I won't answer the question. I, I, I will. I will leave that to uh, well, Dana to uh, um, uh, Neville. If you want to address that, I think it does absolutely address the the relation of the top down and the bottom up, uh, which don't necessarily equate. The question presupposes that there's a top down to a global model of architectural practice. I also think when we talk about globalized practices, I, I agree with the question writer. I, I think this is in between the lines there. There's no justification today. Maybe I'm making this too strong of a case and I'll hear if anybody has a different view, but for globalized practice as if one office, whether it's AECOM or Gensler or some other huge firms operates everywhere. But when you look at say what Neville's doing from Shanghai to Java, 
that's not exactly globalized. That's by local or something like that. And those kinds of practices seem essential to me that we build kind of global networks that are nodal. <laughs> so that we're not operating as a series of enclaves or fiefdoms, but that we don't try to spread ourselves like a virus uh, globally. And the, the key will be that we have local partners and local knowledge and in-depth understandings that we develop across those nodes. Well, thank you for that. It's, um, it's nice to hear and it's, it's much needed because, um, yeah, it is. Uh, the reality is very often this, the assignment um, is really where, where things go wrong. Like if, um, if the assignment lands with a big firm like that, um, then it's often framed in a way that there's very little uh, you can do to kind of alter the brief or to uh, come with an um, alternative agenda. It, it, they are becoming increasingly sophisticated in, in writing assignments that are, are really set in stone and all you need to do is deliver the rendering, right? And which, which is, um, is really why uh, I, I believe this, this kind of global, uh, or yeah, no, I shouldn't use, you're right, Dana, I shouldn't use this word, but this kind of corporate generic urbanism um, is so effective, so, so potent. Um, it, it means that uh, I'm, uh, I'm increasingly inclined to, uh, to avoid those, those projects and, um, and I, I'm forced to, um, find partners that are doing similar things and then build a project from scratch. So uh, it is really about uh, aligning uh, efforts that are already, um, as you described, that are already happening regionally or, or locally. Um, maybe we have time for one more question. If anybody from our audience has anything else they'd like to raise that we haven't yet. Well, I will I will take silence then as uh, as no. Um, the, I, the, the outcomes of this discussion and presentation uh, are in a really interesting way surprising. Um, I think that the discussion about locality or is very different than the the, the battling of uh, globalization or universality uh, in an era of post early or era of postmodernity, um, where the regional was seen as the kind of resistance to uh, universalization. Uh, and I think that Dana, you bring up this, this important issue of local expertise and um, uh, Neville, your, your uh, necessity to, to take your very large scale operations to bring it down, not only to a smaller scale, but a very direct impact on a kind of locality. Uh, and I think, you know, I don't, I, I don't have a, a kind of summary that would necessarily uh, turn um, these notions uh, of how we think about the, 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 the planetary or the local, let's not call it the global, um, or the, the, the more top-down versus a bottom-up kind of mode of operation. Uh, uh, but I think that this is, this is certainly um, uh, uh, an area which will uh, transform the, the less will able to be uh, mobile. Um, I think that as, uh, as it is um, uh, 720 here in New York and uh, well 1220, 120 in Europe, uh, and it might be morning in uh, some parts of the world Neville. Um, but I'd like to, to wrap up and, and well, uh, thank all the, the presenters certainly, but I'd like to thank Dean Perbellini for uh, the support for, for this series. And uh, for Al Alessandra Mellis and, and Tom Kovac for including a, a, this, this was one of the events in uh, the Italian virtual uh, pavilion. Uh, and uh, really to our audience for joining our, our internal student community and public community uh, for joining today. Thank you very much. This, like all other events, will be on YouTube live on our channel uh, and available in a few days uh, if, uh, if you're just checking in uh, uh, recently and haven't seen the whole thing. So thank you very much, uh, Dana, to Neville, uh, Don Bates, and uh, Michael Weinstock, who signed off just earlier. Uh, really appreciate your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Lana, thank you, Neville. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being our guest.